Hey, how's it going? Good morning. <laughs> so excited to be with you guys up here this morning. Uh, grab a, uh, a Bible if you got one. If you need one, throw your hand up. Someone's going to bring one to you. Uh, just leave it up long enough for them to see you. We're going to be Luke chapter 11. Uh, just starting chapter, uh, yeah, just starting out chapter 11 today. <clears throat> While you guys are finding that, let's take a minute and just uh, invite the Lord to speak to us this morning. Our Father in heaven, we do thank you this morning, God, that you are a God that cares about us, or a God that knows us, calls us your kids. We thank you for your word this morning, Lord, that you spoke and are speaking. I thank you for the reality of the Holy Spirit, that he's here and he's present, that he's wanting to penetrate our hard hearts and and to conform us to the image of your son. I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you love to pour out gifts. You love to pour out truth and you love to reshape our minds. God, we just ask this morning that you would do a great work. Father, I am not eloquent enough to stand up here and talk without the supernatural work of the Holy Spirit. And God, no one in here is interested in what I have to say. God, we hold in our hand the living word of God. We acknowledge it as our ultimate authority. We believe that you wrote it. We believe that by your Holy Spirit, you have penned these words. We believe that these are the words that you spoke, Christ. And as we press into and unpack your teaching on prayer, Lord, would you please supernaturally Enlighten our hearts and our minds this morning. God, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray in a way that changes things. Teach us to pray in a way that that truly changes us and exalts your name. God's people said, amen. 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 If there's one teaching Satan does not want the church to hear, it's one about how to pray rightly. <laughs> Satan hates when you pray. Did you know that? If you really want to make him mad, you just, you just start praying. I've never experienced in my life more opposition and oppression towards any single act in my life than praying to the Father. I don't know if anyone feels that way. <laughs> but it's really an amazing thing. I, I'll decide, like, hey, I'm going to go for a prayer walk. And as soon as I do that, instantly my phone starts ringing and something happens that is instantly trying to distract me or all of these things come in and flood in to my mind that would keep me from praying. It's just seriously like spiritual oppression, something keeping me from praying. Never ceases to amaze me. My wife and I'll say, hey, we should pray about that. And then all of a sudden it's like a half an hour later and something came up. I never get that kind of distraction from anything else. When I think, I think I'll go to the fridge and get a, a hot pocket, you know, it's like, Nothing stops me from getting to the <laughs> kitchen. <laughs> Nothing. And I say, hey, I think I want to spend a little bit of time in, in prayer. All of a sudden, it's like gravity increases <laughs> and everything becomes more important. There's a really, really important reason why that is and it's because Satan knows. He knows that if you live and walk out a meaningful and rich and deep prayer life, that you will begin to start to think like Christ. And you will begin to start to shape culture around you to look like Christ culture. He knows that you'll begin to walk in freedom if you pray. He knows that you'll, you'll stop living under the guilt of that, that, that sin and condemnation that has been strangling you for, for years. He knows if you start to pray, you'll start to actually believe that God can do things in the world. He knows if you start to pray, you'll actually start to get to know the attributes of, of God and that you'll actually start to walk in power and the Holy Spirit will be there just ready to work through. He knows that. He knows that if you believe the gospel, then he's lost. He knows the only thing he has against you is this idea that the gospel's not true and that you actually have to pay for your own sins and that you need to feel really guilty today in order to get uh, through your day. Prayer connects you to the heart of God, to the person of God. It keeps you from, from latching onto the things that he does and the things that he gives and it actually causes you to latch onto the person of God himself. Prayer is what keeps us from becoming collectors of, of knowledge. 
Prayer is what keeps us from becoming collectors of good behavior or good action. Prayer is what reminds us of why we're actually Christians, and that is for the person of Jesus Christ, the relationship with Jesus Christ. That's why what Jesus uh, said, if you want to know what the true measure of someone's spirituality is, look at their prayer closet. It's not the Pharisees who are out flaunting their prayers for everyone to see in public. The person who prays in private does so because he or she truly believes that God is there and God hears and God can change things and God can change them and that prayer is accessing power. Prayer says a lot. Tim Keller says this, he said, prayer is awe, intimacy, struggle, yet the way to reality. There's nothing more important or harder or richer or more life altering. There's absolutely nothing so great as prayer. And he's absolutely right. I like how he says that it's the only way to reality because truly that's what prayer is. He says in a separate quote, he says, prayer is like waking up from a nightmare to reality. We laugh at what we look, took so seriously inside the dream. We realize that all is truly well. Of course, prayer can have the opposite effect. It can puncture illusions, show us we are in more spiritual danger than we thought. Prayer actually, it actually wakes you up from what you thought was so real before you started praying. Have you guys ever experienced that? Something is stressing you out, it's hindering you, it's binding you, you begin to pray and all of a sudden you feel like, wow, is that not a big deal anymore? What just changed? It's like waking up from a dream, you know, that stressful dream where, you know, you show up to work without pants on or whatever it is or, you know, you guys want to know what I dream about on Saturday? It's that I'm up here and I'm totally unprepared. That's my dream on Saturday nights. It's terrifying. I stand before you and I go, oops, I don't know what I'm going to say. And you wake up and you realize, oh, that was a dream. Prayer does that. Snaps you out of this lie that Satan wants you to perpetually be stuck in. It's really important. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. But prayer is kind of a universal thing, isn't it? It's not just something Christians do. Prayer is something that basically every religion on the face of the earth has some sort of prayer. Uh, Muslims pray five times a day. They're probably much more devout than we are uh, in their prayer. Um, Buddhists and Hindus, they pray through these flags that they hang up. You guys have probably seen them around. Um, the Jews in, in Israel, even today, they, they write prayers on, on pieces of paper and put them into the wailing wall and they sit there all day um, praying at the wall. Um, prayer is something that's kind of a common vernacular in our culture, right? It's not something, if you say to a stranger, hey, can I pray for you? They probably won't get too offended if you say, hey, can I pray for you in Jesus' name? They're probably not gonna like that. But prayer is kind of a universal thing, right? Everyone likes to pray. I actually was surprised to find that in 2004, one study said that 30% of atheists sometimes pray. <laughs> Isn't that funny? It just further solidifies for me that I don't believe in atheists. I, I don't think that there's such a thing as an atheist because I, I think everybody knows deep down that there's a God. 17% of atheists admitted that they pray regularly. I don't know who they're praying to. Uh, maybe science, I don't know, like evolution, um, something like that. But prayer is sort of a universal, uh, a universal thing. But the question I wanna ask this morning is what sets Christian prayer apart from universal prayer? What's the, what's the difference between the prayer of a Christian and the prayer of a universalist or the prayer of a Buddhist or the prayer of a secular humanist or the prayer of an atheist? What's the difference? What's, what's different about Jesus followers' prayers? What's unique about them? And why should we pray? Now, these are not questions that I thought up. These are questions that are answered in our, our text this morning and these questions ultimately, I believe, were on the minds of the disciples as they came up to Christ and asked him for instruction. So go to Luke chapter 11. We'll start in verse one. And let's see what's going on in our text this morning. It says in verse one, now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And then Jesus goes on from there to recite something you guys are very familiar with that's usually known as the Lord's Prayer. But what's happening here is disciples are having some of the same questions. See, Jesus, why are they asking this question? Jesus lived in a rich prayer life. I mean, everything that he did always had prayer attached to it. He prayed at his baptism. Remember, he, he withdrew constantly into the mountains to pray. Uh, he prayed all night before choosing the 12. Uh, when they were going up the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was headed up there too pray, right? That's what Jesus did. John 17, we get this whole chapter about Jesus' prayer to the Father. He prayed before the Lord's Supper. He prayed for Peter's faith. He prayed in the garden. He even prayed on the cross. 
Jesus walked in a rich prayer life of connectivity to the Father. He did so because he had to, because he was on a strict mission to, to die for you and I, for the world, and in order to do so, he had to be connected to his power source, the Father. So him and the Father constantly needing to be in connection through the access point of prayer. His disciples watched Jesus in his prayer life, and at some point they start to go, I wonder how we should pray. Now, earlier in Jesus' ministry, he had some pretty harsh things to say about the way that uh, the religious leaders at that time had prayed. In Matthew, um, on the Sermon on the Mount, in different places, Jesus actually gives some specific instruction about prayer. And he has a lot of negative things to say about the way that the typical Jew was praying in that time. And so his disciples are kind of looking at each other like, well, I wonder how we're supposed to pray. And on top of that, it says in verse 1 that they said, teach us to pray like John taught his disciples. John who? That would be John the Baptist. That's not his last name. He's the John the Baptizer, okay? John the Baptizer, if you guys know this, actually had many disciples before Christ came onto the scene. And many of those disciples uh, left John the Baptizer and went and began to follow Jesus. And apparently, John the Baptist, he'd given some lectures to his students about what it looked like to pray in a way that was Christ-exalting or in a way that, that honored God. And so now they're saying, okay, well, now we're following this new rabbi, this Jesus of Nazareth. So why don't, why don't, we want to know how he says to pray. So while Jesus is praying, one of them comes up to him and he says, Lord, teach us how, how to pray. What is it about the way that we pray that should be different from the way that everyone else prays? And that's exactly what we're gonna dive into uh, this morning. Now, before we get into what's commonly called the Lord's Prayer, and, and you guys have heard of it before, um, I want to just say a couple things by way of preface, okay? First of all, we always call this the Lord's Prayer, and that's probably not the most helpful name, because it's actually not the Lord's Prayer. It's, it, it's actually the disciples' prayer. Um, Jesus is not praying. He's teaching them how to pray. If you want to know what the Lord's Prayer is, go to John 17 and read that on your own. Okay, that's the Lord's Prayer. But really what we get here, um, and also in Matthew 6, is Jesus teaching his disciples how they should pray. That's why in the prayer he says, forgive us our sins. And Jesus wouldn't pray that because he was sinless, right? So what he's doing here is he's actually teaching them how to pray rather than giving them a prayer to pray. Now, this is one of the most famous pieces of scripture in the whole Bible, and that puts me at a bit of a deficit with you guys this morning, because what happens is you go, oh, we're talking about the Lord's Prayer. I got this. I've known it since I was a kid. I don't really need to like, tune in this morning. I, I, I got that piece of scripture, okay? But I would disagree, actually. I've been saying this, rehearsing this, had this memorized since I was a kid, and this week, as I studied it, I was blown away uh, by some of the depth to this, this, this prayer that we maybe haven't understood, Tim Keller says this, he said, the Lord's prayer may be the single set of words spoke more often than any other in the world, yet it is untapped, or it is an untapped resource, partially because it is so very familiar. So I'm gonna ask you guys this morning, as we look at this Lord's prayer and we break it down, I'm gonna ask you to try as hard as you can to set aside your preconceived notions of it and to actually take a look at it as though it was the first time, as though Jesus was here actually with you guys and we said, hey, will you teach us how to pray? And he said, here's how you do it. The, the level of attentiveness that we would give to the way that he did it. I wanna give that to it this morning. So here's kind of our, our grid, our kind of our outline, what we're gonna do this morning. First, I wanna just spend some time with you going line by line through this prayer. And after we do that, we're gonna do what Jesus did, and that was to go back and highlight a couple things, to double click on a couple things out of this prayer that he thinks are really important. So we, he gives us a pattern for prayer, and then in verses five through 13, he actually gives us a, a little bit of knowledge about the person who we pray to. And boy, does it matter. It really matters that we understand who we pray to because it informs the way that we pray. Our theology will inform our prayer. It just absolutely does. So let's dive right in. Before we do that, I know you guys have been up, down, up, down, up, down. Can you stand one more time with me? And I just want you to read just the prayer with me. I just grab your Bibles, chapter 11, verse 2. And I want, I gotta say this, you're gonna, you're gonna be tempted to click into memorization mode and start quoting it the way that you've heard it. Uh, but this is a different prayer than the one that you typically quote. You're, there's gonna be some lines that are missing. So, so keep your nose in your Bible. If you've got a different translation, that's okay. But let's all pray out loud. Let's all read this out loud. Here we go, ready? Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins 
For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. Amen. You can sit back down. So you're probably noticing right away, wait a minute, there's some serious lines missing in there. Okay, well, the, the, the prayer you're probably thinking of is Matthew chapter 6. Jesus gives that Lord's Prayer um, within the context of a teaching about prayer. I definitely recommend uh, maybe some homework for you. Go and check that out, study that a little bit more. But this seemingly is a different account, a different time when Jesus is teaching a different audience about seemingly a different prayer that's very similar, but much shorter, much more abbreviated. You'll, you'll notice some really big lines that are kind of missing there. So let's kind of work our, our way through it. Now, the outline of this prayer is real simple. It starts out with an address, who it's to, and then it just moves into five petitions, five questions. So we're just going to go one by one and work our way through it. So verse two, he said to them, when you pray, Father, Say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. First thing I want you to notice is that he says when you pray, right? He doesn't say if you pray. He says when you pray, pray like this, okay? Now, what Jesus is teaching them here, and this is important, what Jesus is teaching them here is not a prayer that was meant to just be prayed corporately together. He wasn't giving them something just to rehearse together as part of our liturgy and a church service. Although we should do that and we can do that and we do do that as Christians. But ultimately what Jesus is giving them in this prayer is a pattern. He's teaching them the way to pray. It doesn't have to be this exact prayer. There's nothing holy or special about this exact prayer. It's a pattern for how we should pray. So what we're gonna really look at is what is the pattern? What is the code here that Jesus is trying to communicate? And the very first thing that he says is the address, and the address is one word. What is it? Father. Now, Matthew's account, that's the one that says, our Father who art in heaven. But Luke's account just says Father. Just very simple, just one word, Father. Now, the Greek word for Father is pater. That very well could have been the word that Jesus could have used, could have selected, um, and it would have been totally fine. But that's not the word that he uses. He, he chooses uh, the Aramaic word, which is Abba. Everybody say Abba. Good job. Abba is the Aramaic word basically for daddy or papa. The reason why is it kind of sounds like something a one-year-old would say, right? I mean, my, my little one-year-old, like she does all kind of jibber-jabber and I'm sure I've heard the word Abba in there a few times. She speaks Aramaic, she doesn't even know it, okay? So in the Aramaic world, essentially, that's probably the first word that would come out of a lot of babies' mouth and it would be when they would look at their papa, their daddy, Abba. This is a term of endearment. This is a term of closeness, a term of, of love. Now, Jesus could have selected many, a plethora of words that he, that he could have to, to describe how we should address the one that we're praying to. He could have said, sovereign Lord, omnipotent one, all-knowing, cosmic, powerful God. He could have done that. He could have picked any of the names that we have for God in the Old Testament, but he didn't do that. Jesus said, when you pray, say, Abba. Abba, he's your dad. He's your father. When you pray, don't think that you're yelling off into the distance hoping that some cosmic entity and force will maybe hear you and maybe know you and, and maybe remember you and possibly answer your prayer if you say it enough and repetitiously enough and offer the right sacrifice. This is not the kind of God that we pray to. Nor is the God that we pray to some universal idea. It is a specific person Emphasis on the word person. And he is our father and he lends his ear to his kids. Last night about 3 a.m., my, my daughter, actually it wasn't, it wasn't quite that late. Some point, who knows, I was sleeping. Some point my daughter wakes up and she's really upset. She's upset because she realized that her little sister wasn't in the room with her and she felt alone. And, but you know, when she cried out, I didn't go, oh, there's some kid somewhere. Keep crying, you know. I mean, that, that's not what happened. My heart immediately was tuned to the voice of my sweet four-year-old daughter who is my daughter. She's my daughter. And I know her voice. And she knows my name. And when we go to pick up our kids after church and we look over the gate and there's five million kids in one room because we're heritage. And, and I mean, seriously, uh, it, you see your kid and your kid makes eye contact with you and they say, daddy or mommy, isn't that the greatest thing? It's the greatest thing. How weird would it be if I walked up to the gate and my daughter went, 
Pastor Sam. <laughs> like, what is that? Nobody calls me that. Okay, so no, that, that just would be weird. No, call me dad. Call me papa. That's how we, that's how God wants to be addressed. He wants you to think of him as a father. I love how Kent Hughes puts it. He says this, unlike such terms as omnipotence and omniscience, words that have the feel of computer software, Abba calls us to the most intimate terms with God. There's nothing like this in any of the world's great religions. Jesus' call to address God as dearest father abounds with relationship, intimacy, security. It is ineffably sweet. It's not, you know, I mean, there, there's value in words like omniscience and omnipotence. Absolutely, those are attributes of our God and we should discuss those. But when you talk to God, he's your dad. He lends you his ear because you are part of him. Calvin said, by the great sweetness of this name, Father, he frees us from all distrust. There is a reason, listen to me, there is a reason that this prayer pattern starts with the gospel. It starts with God's paternal love for you, that he is your dad, because <laughs> Jesus does not want you moving any further into the avenue of prayer until you acknowledge that he is your father and that he loves you, and that he is listening to you. It's really interesting, just as a side note, and I'll let you study this on your own, but it's really interesting that Jesus referred to the Father as Abba every single time in the New Testament except one place. You know where that was? It was on the cross when he and the Father had been separated because of our sin. He said, not Abba, Abba, why have you forsaken me? He said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he went through separation from the Father so that you and I could become children of God. Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, God has sent the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying Abba, Father. Paul says in Romans 8, 15, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Because Jesus was disconnected from the Father, we now become children of God. And you know, the first time that Jesus ever referred to us as his brothers was after the cross. It was after the cross. Isn't that great? So first he says, pray, Father. Then Notice the first of the petitions. When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Why does he say name? Why doesn't he say, when you pray, say, Lord, may you be hallowed. You as in the essence of you. May you yourself be hallowed. That's not what he says. What he says is, hallowed be your name. Why are we hallowing his name? Why don't we hallow his being, his person? And the reason is because we don't understand the way names were thought of in the ancient world. In the ancient world, names actually meant something. Name wasn't just something that you get called Sam. That means nothing to me. It's just a name that people call me, okay? Um, if I want to know what it means, I got to go back and look at what it meant in Hebrew, okay? I can't remember what it means. Something like called by God or something. I should, it's my name. But name, this is my making my point here, okay? Names mean nothing to us. They really don't. They're just names. But in this time, names represented something about your character, something about your story, something about your life. And not only that, but in the honor-shame culture, which is the culture that Jesus is speaking this in, your name add great value to you in terms of the way people thought of you. Your name was actually more valuable than your possessions. To have a good name was worth spending money on. In our day, we care more about comfort and less about our name or our reputation, in their day, it was all about name, all about reputation, a lot less about comfort. So God is for his name. And when he's for his name, he's for himself. He's for his own attributes and the completeness of his attributes, the completeness of his nature. So to hallow his name is to hallow who he is. You're saying, Sam, what is hallow? <laughs> How many times in the last year have you used the word hallow? Not a single time. Yep, okay. So what is the word hallow? We gotta break that down. Hallow is the word hagiazo, the Greek word, and it basically just means to set apart. It's basically holy. That's what holiness means. Sanctifi sanctification and holiness are the same thing. You're becoming set apart. 
What Jesus is telling them to pray is he's saying, pray that the name of God, which is all of his attributes, the essence of his being, would be hallowed. In other words, hagiazo, that would be set apart, that would be holied. Lord, holy be your name. That's what you are to pray. Luther says, what are we praying for when we ask for his name to be holy? Is it not holy already? He says, we are praying, God keep us from dishonoring the name by which we are called. To pray, hallowed be your name, is not to say, Lord, make your name hallowed. His name is already hallowed. But to, it, what it is to pray is to say, God, may my life further seek to yield to the reality that your name is holy and set apart, that you are greater than anything else. Do you know what this is? This is worship. Did you know that worship and prayer are kind of like the same thing? It's not like I need to worship, oh wait, I need to pray. It's like actually they're meant to be together. Worship and prayer, I mean, it should be seamless. What Jesus is doing is when you start praying, start worship first. Because worship aligns you to the reality of who God is and what he's said. Father, hallowed be your name. You might as well, I mean, you could say it a million ways. You could say, Father, you are ultimate reality. Or Father, you are the greatest source of love and strength and power. Make your name great. May your name be known. That's what he's praying. Just holy be your name. This is what the angels are singing in heaven nonstop. It's praise. It's worship. Prayer is meant to begin with worship. It's kind of comical to me, actually, that the Israelites, that the, the Jews, for thousands of years, kept sacred the name of God. You ever heard about that? The, the Yahweh? The, 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 the way that you're actually supposed to say it, they, they never pronounce it because they were so worried about taking the Lord's name in vain. But when you look at the Old Testament, they dragged the name of the Lord through the mud for hundreds of years, putting pagan idols in his temple. Don't say his name. Well, what really defiles the name of God is when you change his attributes. What really defiles the name of God is when you live in such a way that doesn't make him supreme in your life. To hallow his name is to say that you are higher above all gods, all things, ultimate source of value in the universe. That's to hallow his name. And here Israel is saying, well, don't say his name. We don't want to, we don't want to defame him or we don't, we don't want to take his name in vain. But really, their entire existence, largely through the Old Testament, was taking the Lord's name in vain by not truly honoring him. Look at the next line. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. I'm See, I'm adding, I'm just naturally adding Matthew's things in there. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come is the next line. Your kingdom come. What, is, what does that mean? We talked about kingdom a few weeks ago here. Um, and essentially, it's this. Kingdom, the kingdom of God is wherever God is reigning. You guys remember that? Wherever God's reign is manifest, that is the kingdom of God. And in, in Matthew's version of this prayer, he adds the line, um, your kingdom come, your will be done. And that's helpful actually because what Jesus is saying to pray is he's saying that, that your prayer should be not only that God's name would be hallowed, but also that his kingdom reign would be manifested here on this earth as it is in heaven. This should be our prayer, both universally and personally. When I say universally, I mean that our prayer should be that God's kingdom reign will be manifested on the entirety of this earth. We should long to see Jesus reigning in this earth. It's really funny, you know, the other day I was out for a walk and I was um, just around the corner from my house and I, and I noticed on a fence in my neighborhood that, that some gang or something had, had tagged a fence, sort of like a, hey, this is our turf kind of thing. Um, and I just thought, how funny is that, you know? Like, this is not their land. But they think by spray painting it that it's their land. I mean, it's, it's, it's silly. I mean, it really is. I mean, because do they own it? Do they have the deed to it? Is it their fence? Like, no. They just decided, I'm going to spray paint this. This is how ridiculous the, the, the current administration of the world is. It's not their world. It's not Satan's world. He just thinks it is. And the Christian life should be lived as though we are actually in rebellion to the current administration of this world. Have you ever thought about it like that? Have you ever thought about prayer as active rebellion against the current administration of this world? That when you pray, you're actually rebelling and saying, no, 
it shouldn't be this way. There shouldn't be hunger. There shouldn't be brokenness. There shouldn't be sin. There shouldn't be rape. There shouldn't be incest. There shouldn't be poverty because that is not the way the kingdom of God is going to be. And when we engage in mission and we engage in prayer, we are rebelling against the brokenness of the world. That should not be that way. Think about that next time you get on your knees. Think, I am rebelling. I am calling in airstrikes right now against the enemy because this is not his world. He tagged it with a spray gun, but it's not his. It's Christ and he's coming. That's what prayer is meant to be. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come in this world, but not only just in this world, but also in me. There's a personal element to that prayer where you say, not only do I want your kingdom to come in this world, but I want your kingdom to come through my life by the way that I live, by living open-handed. By saying, whatever my life is, it's subservient to your kingdom. I am second. Lord, you are first. Your kingdom purposes are first. Before Jesus even touches a single petition, he first admonishes the fact that it is not our kingdom. It's his. And that everything that we should want in life should always be second to the cause and the purpose and the plan of the Father. It's funny, you know, if, if uh, you guys ever watch that show Fixer Upper? Yeah? Ever, come on, you guys all watch that show. Come on, don't lie. Okay, so, you know, it's funny because these, these guys are really good at fixing up houses and, and they come in and they, they take these old houses and they fix them up. And, and the best houses, you know what the best houses are? They're the ones where the owners are just like, you guys do whatever you want, I don't care. Just play and have fun. The worst houses are the ones where they're like, oh, I kind of want to have like black walls and, you know, maybe like this color carpet. And they're like, okay, you know, we'll work on it. The best houses are the ones where they say, hey, you know better how this thing should look. You're the expert. You just do it. Uh, and, and, and just tell me where I need to go. Tell me what wall I need to rip down and whatever. Okay, this is what this prayer is. God, you know how to renovate this world. You know what you're gonna do in this world. You know how you're gonna come in here and set up shop and establish your kingdom. Whatever that looks like, just tell me where to go. Tell me what my line is. Tell me where my part is. Tell me where to stand. Your kingdom come. It's all about what you want, Father. You're coming to renovate this world and I just wanna be part of it. This is how Jesus is teaching them to pray. Your kingdom come, not only just personally, but also eschatologically, meaning the future. He's also telling them to pray that, the, 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 that Jesus would come and get, give his kingdom in the end times. Lord, just come quickly. Come establish your reign. Now, before we move into the next half of this prayer, I just wanna point something out. Have you noticed, up until this point, everything in this prayer has been vertical? Everything in this prayer has been vertical. There has been a single request yet Everything has been praise. Everything has been adoration. Everything has been acknowledgement that he is our father and his kingdom is more valuable and his name is to be hallowed. Now, it, it, I was gonna preach this sermon uh, last week and then we just kind of had a, a switch up in schedule so I've actually been thinking about this for two weeks and you're thinking, wow, Sam, this sermon should be way better because you've had two weeks to work on it. But um, I've been thinking about this for two weeks and I've been praying like this for two weeks. And the majority of my prayers up to this point really started with what I wanted and what I was thinking. And then slowly over time, they would finally kind of move to this place of, of, of okay, God, you're better. You're more valuable. What you want actually is better. But then I started flipping it like this prayer teaches us to do. And I started starting my prayers with worship, starting my prayers with the gospel, starting my prayers with admonition for who he is and what he's done. And it's been amazing how much more fruitful my prayers are. It's been incredible. I don't typically start. Now, you don't always have to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be like, Peter, if he would have done that when he was sinking in the water, he would have been in trouble, right? He's like starting to sink. Oh, Father, hallowed be in the name of God. Oh, he would have been gone. He would have been down in the water, right? He just said, Lord, help. Lord, save me. You know, I mean, he, that's all he had time to get out. So you don't always have to start there. But I'm talking about the kind of prayer that is gonna transform you. I'm not talking about just a quick prayer while you're driving, maybe you see a car accident or something, or maybe, you know, whatever, whatever that thing is. I'm talking about your time of prayer where you're pressing into the Lord and having relationship with him. You try this, you test this, and you say, before I get into petitions, I'm gonna spend time worshiping who God is and praising his name and yielding to his kingdom, and you watch your requests change. They'll change. What you were gonna pray when you started will probably be different because you will instantly conform to the reality of God's infinite worth over what you were about to ask. Now that doesn't mean that you don't ask. And Jesus doesn't stop the prayer there. 
He doesn't stop the prayer there. He, he goes on. Look at the next line. <clears throat> it gets very practical. He says, give us each day our daily bread. Now, this is a really tough one for us to get because we don't live day to day. I mean, if I run out of grocery money, I can dig into my cupboard and find some like can of Campbell's soup. You know that one you've been avoiding for like three weeks? Um, just praying you would get groceries before you'd have to eat that or whatever that thing is in your fridge that you know you could eat it if you were starving. Um, you know, we could make ketchup sandwiches with saltines or something, you know, if you needed to. Um, this is how we live. I can always take the credit card and then go down and get McDonald's or whatever. I mean, this is not how they lived. When Jesus says, pray for your daily bread, he's assuming <clears throat> that he's speaking to a context that literally doesn't have bread for tomorrow or the next day. He's literally speaking to people that had just enough money to survive the next day. And it's really hard for us to get that. And there's nothing wrong with the fact that I have a refrigerator full of food. But in reality, what's wrong is when I start to forget that that food has been given by my provider. Jesus wants his kids living in a constant state of need, recognizing their need before him. It's very important. So he says, give us this day our daily bread. It's not just, by the way, not just talking about bread. It's also talking about the needs that we have throughout the day, spiritual needs. Father, help me today. Give me your spirit to have patience, to get through, to have the sustenance that I need. I love Proverbs uh, chapter 30, verse seven. It says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food that I need or I shall be full and deny you and say, who is the Lord? Or I shall be poor and steal and profane the name of my God. This is what Jesus is teaching them to pray. He's not saying, uh, give us this day our daily dessert or whatever. He's saying, give us this day our daily bread. Just give us what we need, Lord. God, don't give me so much that I end, I end up thinking that life's about me. Don't give me so much that I start thinking I don't need you. Don't give me so little that, I, that I'm tempted to steal and profane your name, but just give me what's convenient for me, Lord. How many times have you prayed that? Lord, if you don't want me, if you don't want me to have an RV, okay. If you don't want me to have a nicer car, if you, if you don't want me to ever own a home, that's fine. If you want me to be in an apartment forever, Lord, whatever it is, just give me what's convenient for me. Help me to be a good steward. I'm not talking about being, being, being stupid with your money. I'm just talking about, do we live like that, open-handed? God, whatever you want from me, I just want that. Just daily bread, Lord, that's all I need. This is what he was trying to teach Israel in the wilderness. They just couldn't get it. Don't store it, just keep it. Eat it, and then he'll be there for you the next day. He moves on to the next line. He says, forgive us our sins as we here, let me, let me start over. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Now, first thing I want you to notice there is it seems weird that he switches words. He says, forgive us our sins that we could forgive those who are indebted to us. Aren't those two separate things? Well, no, actually, they're, they're not. They're actually the same thing. And I'm glad that it's there because I actually think the best way to think about sin is to think of it as debt. It's debt. Every time you sin, you are charging an account of someone. If you lose your temper and you freak out, you're costing someone by that, someone's emotions. It's kind of like credit, you know, like we think that, you know, if we charge up credit cards um, and we file bankruptcy, that that just goes away. But it actually, it doesn't go away. Someone has to eat that, right? I mean, either the government has to eat it or more than likely the credit company has to eat it. So no matter what, there's no such thing as just forgetting debt. I mean, when God said to Israel that you will have this year of jubilee, this year of forgetting debt, it doesn't mean they just go away. Someone has to eat it. This is why we want retribution. When someone hurts us, we want them to say sorry. We want them to pay us back because sin is debt. It's hurting someone and it's costing someone. He's saying, forgive us our sins as we forgive our debtors, because the two, they're, they're really the same. But I want you to notice something. This is, this is probably the most terrifying part of this prayer. Are you excited? Okay. The most ter this is what Augustine called the terrible petition. Okay. He said, look, he says, forgive us our sins and please help us forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Is that what it, is that what it says? No, it doesn't say that. It says, forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. That's kind of 
tricky, Jesus. <laughs> you like built a phrase into that petition that makes it to where I can't pray it unless it's true. You notice that? He literally built a mechanism in there where you cannot pray for the forgiveness of God unless you come to the Lord at a place that you have forgiven those who have sinned and acquired debt against you. That's why Augustine called it the terrible petition. Spurgeon said, unless you have forgiven others, you read your own death warrant when you read the Lord's prayer. <laughs> I remember hearing a story from a, a lady at a conference once that was um, from Uganda and she was part of some kind of a mass genocide there that happened and her whole family was murdered. And she grew up just carrying the weight and the anger against these men that had destroyed her family and her whole life. And I remember her saying that for years she would go to church and the Lord's prayer would be recited and she could not pray it because she honestly was knowing that she would not forgive these men. Forgive us our, 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 our debts as we, uh, I can't do it, I can't say it. What Jesus is saying is he's, he's, he's essentially saying whatever level you choose to forgive will be the level that will be forgiven you. Interesting thing, isn't it? Finally, at some point, she's overcome with the gospel and was able to forgive these men that had killed her family and was able at some point to pray that prayer. Just amazing how Jesus works that in. And he does that because he doesn't separate loving God from loving people. And he also, he, he knows that for those that have listened, now listen to this, he knows that for those that have truly experienced grace, they will truly be able to express grace. To the same level that you have truly realized the grace of God will be the same level that you can truly pass on the grace of God. If you can't forgive, it's because you have not fully realized just how forgiven you are. If you truly wanna realize how forgiven you are, you need to forgive. If they're connected, they're tied together, that's so why C.S. Lewis said to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Jesus purposely builds that in to do some heart work, to do a little bit of heart check there. The last line he says, lead us not into temptation. And this is his protection, right? Lead us not into temptation. Uh, Matthew's account of this prayer uh, adds um, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And that line helps us understand what he means here because when you first read that, you go, wait, does God tempt us? I'm like, well, no. James says that he doesn't, James 1, 13. But what God does do is he allows trials into our life for the, 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 the purpose of purifying our faith. Just like Jesus, he allowed him to be led into the wilderness to be tempted, that his faith could be purified. And this prayer is just simply a request for God to, to, to give me the strength to not sin against you, that I might not curse your name, that I might not, um, not hallow your name, Lord. That's basically what he's, he's saying. He's just admit your, your need for the spirit of God to give you strength in your temptations. So there it is. There's, there's the prayer. I just, I just want you to step back and look at it and think about the progression. Think about how its place. Now, that's not the only thing that Jesus wants you to see, though, this morning. Okay, one last thing here. Jesus not only gives the pattern for prayer, but then he turns his attention and he begins to talk about the person who we pray to. So let's keep, let's keep reading and see the next part that he says. And really, this next section, it's, it's com almost like commentary on the Lord's Prayer. It's kind of like commentary on what he's just said. Verse five. He said to them, which of you has a friend who will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, Lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me, the door is now shut. My children are with me in bed, I cannot get up. Notice he says cannot, when re reality he will not get up, uh, and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence or persistence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. So Jesus, after giving this pattern for prayer, he launches into this, uh, really this uh, contrast example. This is made up story. And he basically says this, how many of you guys have a friend who's so obtuse, so brash, so ridiculous, that if he had a friend come over at three in the morning, would actually come over to your house and pester you because he didn't have any food to give his friend. This is completely ridiculous kind of a, a scenario. Like this, he says it in such a way that makes you think it probably wouldn't happen. 
Now, there's a couple of things you need to understand about, about this before to, to really get the, the gravity of it. Okay, first of all, when you shut the door in your house in the Middle East in, the, in, in this time, you don't want to open it again. It's not like our door where you have a hinge. You just pull it open and you put it shut. No, when you shut the door, you're in for the night. And it's a big, loud, noisy thing to open it up again. So this man is in his home, single room dwelling, his family, they all slept together in one room. His kids are finally asleep. They're probably trying to get them to sleep for two hours. They're finally out. Not that I know anything about that. If it's 2 a.m., 3 a.m., uh, the door is shut. Uh, they're, they're asleep. And here comes his neighbor, clunk, clunk, clunk on the door. Hey, buddy, I just had a friend come over. Why is he doing that? He's doing that partially because Middle Eastern um, hospitality demands it, right? This guy, he got woken up by someone else. And so he's going to go wake up his neighbor because someone else woke him up. And he apparently didn't have any bread left over. So he goes to his neighbor's house and he, and he wakes him up. Now, what's the point of this? What is the point of this story? Why is Jesus saying this? He's saying it, first of all, because he's trying to paint a contrast between the, what I would call the bothered friend and the better father. The bothered friend and the better father. The first thing he's trying to say is he's saying, look at the boldness and the brashness of this man who is so, he's, he's so, I don't know a better word, he's so brash that he would go over and, and wake up his neighbor just to put some food on the table for a friend. That's not a life or death situation, by the way. It's not like, hey, my son just fell off the bunk bed and split his open, can you take me to the hospital or something like that. It's just like, hey, do you have some food? Jesus is saying, how ridiculous would it be for, for this guy to do that? But yet he's so bold and he has such faith in his friend's ability to give him some food that he's going to go bother this guy in order to get what he needs. Jesus is saying, this is how you should think about the way you pray. You should be bold in your prayer. Not just like, hey, Lord, you know, like I know you're busy and you're running the world and you got 7 billion people and stuff's crazy in the Middle East right now. And like, I know you're busy and stuff and like Donald Trump, you know, election and Hillary wrote a book and I know it's getting real crazy. But I don't even have time, but no. Knock, knock, knock. Hey, Lord, I know it's 3 a.m., but your door is wide open. I'm here. I want to talk. My wife and I were awake at 4 a.m. last night because my daughter wouldn't go to sleep. And she had croup, so we're outside and we're praying outside at 4 a.m. for my daughter. And guess what? Jesus wasn't like, hey, can you, I'm sleeping, Sam. No, he's a good father. He's ready, waiting for me. He doesn't sleep. He wants me to be like this guy and come over at any point, at any time. He says, seek and you will find. Ask and it will be given. Knock and the door will be open. Notice the emphasis on the activity of the prayer. It's something that you need to actually go after. I don't know, I don't think about prayer that way. I think about prayer like, well, God's sovereign, you know. I should probably pray for a couple minutes today because that's what Christians do. You know, Lord, help me get a parking space. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> you must love me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I have to park in the North 40. I guess you don't. You know, and like, no, th this is not the kind of prayer Jesus was inviting them to. He was inviting them to bold, brash, active, persistent, pursuant prayer that believes that something's going to happen when you do it. If this guy, who's really not a very good friend and he's just kind of annoyed, will actually end up getting up to give him some food. How much more would your father listen to your petitions? Listen to the words of Martin Lloyd-Jones. I love this quote. He says this, this holy boldness, this argumentation, this reasoning, this putting the case before God, this pleading his own promises, this is the whole secret of prayer. Quote the scripture to him and you know God delights to hear us doing it. As a father likes to see this element in his own child who has obviously been listening to what his father has been saying, it pleases him. I love that. Even if, even it's, even if, if, if our motives are a little bit off, God loves to hear his kids petition the very words that he spoke. Because he doesn't change his words. Sometimes I'll tell my daughter she can do something and then she'll petition me on that and I'll go, eh, I changed my mind. God doesn't do that. He's a better father than me. If he says he's gonna do something, he's gonna do it. I want you to think about something in this Lord's Prayer here. Is there a single petition in here that God didn't already promise he was gonna do? 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He already promised that his name would be hallowed. Your kingdom come. He already promised that his kingdom would come. Give us this day our daily bread. He already promised that he would give us our daily bread. Forgive us our debts. He already promised that he would do, and he did it on the cross. Lead us not into temptation. He promised that he would do that. He sent the Holy Spirit to empower us for that. Everything in the Lord's prayer, everything is a petition of what God has already promised. And as his kids, our job is to say, Dad, you said so. Not talking about, I want a Corvette. Dad, you said so. Where in the Bible does it say that you get a Corvette? Where in the Bible does it say that if you have enough faith, gold dust is gonna come or you're gonna be a billionaire? Nowhere. But you know what the Bible does say? It does say that his kingdom is gonna come and that it can come through you. And you say, God, I'm holding you to your promises. He likes that. I didn't say it, he said it. It's not disrespectful. He loves it when you quote his own words to him and say, God, you said, you said that the gospel would spread like wildfire fire, fire through the earth and I want to be part of that. You said your kingdom would come and I want to be part of that. Just ask him. He goes on to a second picture and he closes with this. He says, what father among you, verse 11, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, well, instead of a fish, give him a serpent or a poisonous snake. If he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. A little bit of context, uh, apparently, thus says the commentators. Uh, scorpions in that era could sometimes curl up into a little ball and they would look like an egg, so you could get them confused. If he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. Verse 13, if, then, if you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus is painting another contrast. He says, even the worst fathers in the world know when they say, hey, Dad, can I have a glass of water? You don't give them a, a glass of gas, a gasoline. Say, here, yeah, here you go. Even the best fathers, when they, the, the kid asks them for a fish, they don't say, yeah, here's a poisonous snake. I mean, even just, in, just in built into you as a human being, you have this desire, this paternal DNA desire to take care of your kids. Like you just have it. I mean, even El Chapo probably buys his kids a birthday present. I don't know if you guys know who El Chapo is. He's like a mobster. Okay, that, that didn't go over well. Even El Chapo buys his kid. Okay, so even the worst dads. I mean, and the implication here is that all dads are evil. I mean, that's kind of what he's saying. He's saying, even you being evil fathers, because we're all fallen. We're all, this is original sin. We're all kids of Adam, right? We're all, like, I am not a perfect father. I'm just not. But even I know that when my daughter asks for something or my son asks for something, I give them what they need, right? And the implication is here is that God is a better father than any father you and I have ever experienced. Puts, it, puts us at a bit of a, a kind of a deficit because we don't even have a father to compare to our heavenly father. If even an evil father will give his son or daughter what they need, how much more will your heavenly father give you exactly what you need? And loves to hear you ask. He just wants to hear you ask for anything and everything. He could say no. It's his job as a dad. My daughter, she can ask me for things. My son, he can ask me for things. I can say no, that's my prerogative. But I love it when they ask. That's what he's saying. But there's one thing I want to point out and then we'll close here. Look at what he says at the very last verse. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Does that seem kind of out of place? It seems like it should say how much, okay, so if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your father, how much more will the heavenly father give good gifts? That's what it seems like it should say. But our father is so much better than that. He's so much better that he doesn't just give us good gifts. He gives us the gift giver. He gives us the Holy Spirit himself. He doesn't just give us the spiritual gifts. He says, why don't you take the Spirit? He doesn't just give us blessing from the Spirit. He says, take the Spirit. And that's exactly what he did. When Christ went to the right hand of the Father. He sent the Holy Spirit to come and live within us that you and I would inherit him. 
He is our inheritance. He is our seal, our heavenly seal, and he is what we get. And he is so much greater than what he gives. The substance of the Spirit is better than the work of the Spirit. Did you know that? I would take the Holy Spirit living over me than the Holy Spirit coming upon me for a little while any day. This is what we have access to. He's such a good father. He doesn't give us a snake. He gives us a fish. And what he gives us is the Spirit himself. That's really good news. There's a seeming contradiction here, though, isn't there? He says he's a good father. He's the best father you'll ever have. But you gotta go bang down his door? If he's such a good father, why do we have to ask him so much? If he's such a good father, why do we have to ask him every day for daily bread? What, wouldn't a good father just give us daily bread? Does that seem contradictory a little bit? It's only contradictory if you think that what is best for you is to not have to ask. It's only contradictory if you think that what's best for you is to not have to daily press into the ultimate value in the universe, God himself. That would be a snake. What would be a snake is to give us what we want without us having to see him as the the source of it. What we really need is to see him as the source of everything. And the only way we're gonna get there is when we start asking him. We gotta start asking him. Why do we pray? We pray because God says that it changes things. He says it. That when we pray, he listens. We have biblical accounts of people asking and God saying, okay. If we don't believe that, we won't pray. If you just think that, well, God's gonna do whatever he's gonna do, so I might as well just not pray. You'll be as deep as a puddle. You have to believe that God hears your prayer, loves to hear you pray, and loves to answer your prayer. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. Guys, can we go out of here today and start banging down the door of the Father, asking him about everything, petitioning him on everything? He loves it. If we wanna become deep, rich Christians in the Lord that have a a serious understanding of God's heart, we have got to pray. We gotta pray a lot. And you know what, we gotta pray together. Jesus taught him this prayer to pray together. Our Father, I'll be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In us, give us this day our daily bread. We gotta pray together, we gotta pray. We gotta, we gotta go after the gates of hell in rebellion against the administration of this world with this amazing gift that we've been given called prayer, amen? Amen, let's stand guys. Father, I thank you so much that you truly do love us. And you know us. And you hear our voice and you love it when we pray. And you love to answer our prayers. God, I also thank you that you know better than we do what we actually need. And I thank you that you love us enough sometimes to not give us what we're actually asking for. But I thank you too, Lord, that you give us the privilege of of even partnering with you in your renovation of this world. And Lord, I pray that we would think of prayer, Lord, differently. I pray that we'd think of it as worship. I pray that we would think of it as as really a soul-deepening, soul-cleansing time, Lord, something that really draws us to you and not just to, to knowledge. I pray for our church, Lord, that we would be a church that prays. And that when we stand before you, we would not be saying, look what we did for you. We'd be saying, Lord, we know you. Our life was defined by our relationship with you. Holy Spirit, we just invite you to work continually through us in this church, Father. We pray for our city. God, we pray for the gospel to go through us to this city. We pray that you would save. We pray that that number, Lord, the thousands in this valley that still don't know you would begin to decrease as the gospel goes out. And Lord, we just rebel. We rebel now over the enemy's handhold that he has on this city. We say, no, this is your city, God. It's yours. May we be part of that restoration. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, God bless you guys. Have a good afternoon.